Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm excited to be here. It's like, uh, I feel like I know everybody. I feel connected to everybody through all the Facebook back and forth. Uh, but um, this is a new way to connect. So I'm excited about this. I um, started with Boom Cards just a couple of years ago, I guess, just in the summer, the first summer of, I'm sorry to say it, COVID. And um, I was trying to help out some speech pathologists in Toronto, um, where I'm actually from, by putting my materials up in some sort of format they could use through telepractice to help out. So I was struggling with PowerPoint and trying to make my games in PowerPoint. Um, then in a, a podcast uh, with Todd Houston, who's a, another AVT like me, he mentioned uh, boom cards. So I thought maybe that could work for me. And my, my games actually fit pretty well with that. <laughs> I've been doing them for a while, but I'm more of a print and play guy. And uh, I was so excited with Boom, uh, with what I could actually do and make happen. And I'm still learning, uh, but I'll share with you what I've learned uh, about games and game creation. I've been doing that for about 30 years. And I'll uh, talk about how kind of I try to think about those, those powerful aspects as I create the Boom card. So I think that's important for both um, people who are buying Boom cards to kind of see, does it have these elements? I think they're, they really help children to to engage with the material and the targets that you're trying to teach. Um, but I think it also helps uh, the people who are interested in, in doing what I'm doing is making, uh, making some boom cards and getting into it, which is fun. So these are the first games I drew. Now they were in black and white and people used to get out their pencil crayons when they bought games from me. And they, they, a lot of people still have these because they spent so much time coloring them. Uh, today you can print them or you can uh, you can see them on boom cards nice in nice color um, but you'll notice that the three games these are the first three games I, I ever made I made them to be cooperative and uh, I used to call them allied games uh, because you're not competing against the child some kids that I was seeing in treatment when I was still in my masters back then they would get really upset with losing and so I decided to try to create games that we could both win together. So you'll see, we try to get the baseballs back from mean old Mrs. Garbini's backyard, or we try to help get help this little boy here, get the jewels back to the wizard before the trolls block the exits, or we even try to get the dogs back from the dog catcher. And um, I did this when I was in my master's. And as I walked out of my master's, I walked right into cochlear implants being approved for children. And I was lucky enough to get a job here at a center here in London, Ontario, where I live. And uh, I was struggling because this is a new situation. All of a sudden we have maybe a four-year-old who's starting from scratch with his hearing. He already has a different mode of communication sometimes. And back then the, the kind of the criteria for getting a cochlear implant when it first started was that they just could not benefit from traditional amplification. So these kids spent a lot of time in treatment failing before they even saw me and they'd see my um, speech table and they would just panic. Um, so right from the beginning, I was really trying to figure out what the barriers were for each child, what the interests were for each child and how I could better engage them while we tried to, you know, work on what I thought would take them somewhere and get the biggest bang for the buck. So what I want to focus on today, and I know there are other variables, but these are the ones I think have the biggest bang for the buck, is to worry about attention, whether or not the activity is meaningful for that child, or meaningful in terms of the target. Um, fun is kind of like the sister of attention, I think. <laughs> it, it helps uh, drive attention, and so we're going to talk about making it a little more fun uh, through boom cards, and then how to add story. And I think story, everybody starts to get a little more interested when they're involved in story. It's just, uh, it's true of um, both kids and adults. So let's start with attention. But I'm just gonna show something about challenge uh, just because I was talking about those kids with, with cochlear implants. Now this is, um, this is a graph I adapted from the book Flow. I thought it really kind of showed how when communicative skills align up with um, communicative challenges, uh, we'll say right up here, it matches the same height on communicative challenges. Then the child is challenged, but successful. And you can follow this line up for challenge, but successful. I mean, you can put anything down here. You could put uh, um, 
skills with PlayStation and then how challenging the game is. And you'll know with how challenging the game is, if some kids find it too easy down here where their skills are high, but the challenge is low, they're gonna lose interest. If the, the game is too hard and it's nothing but failure, they're gonna give up on the game. But if they're in this sweet spot, they're challenged yet successful, that's where they're driven to play and they're excited about playing. Um, so as I was saying, you know, some of the kids that I first met in my first real job were overwhelmed by challenge. And so what I ended up doing was kind of undershooting and, and, and trying to make them completely successful. And of course, there's not a lot of learning that happens when they are completely successful. Uh, communication is all about trying, uh, failing, discovering the more powerful unit. You know, two words work better than one. Putting that last consonant on the, the word makes you more understandable. Um, it's all about challenge, but also feeling good and competent about what you've achieved. And so um, this is where they had spent a lot of time before they met me, more challenge with very little success. This zone is hard to get to. And I mean, it's easy when you have a child who's ready to bail on an activity because he perceives it as too difficult. And sometimes it's just the look of the table or the look of the activity and that's it. Uh, it might be just the first time he's had, had a problem. You, you've asked him to repeat, he bails. So our problem sometimes is we're not challenging enough and we stay in these safe zones. And I think parents, it's true of parents as well, they accept um, single words or they get by with gestures because they don't want to stress that system and, and frustrate the child. The problem is, yes, it slows down uh, learning. And when we're really trying to push that information, because we're like they're four years behind and we got to get going, <laughs> so all the challenges, no success, we're just losing them even more. And what we end up is anxiety and withdrawal. Um, and down here, if it's no challenge with all success, we start to, um, uh, sorry, we start to just get apathy and complacency and just, we just stay where we're at. If one word works all the time, why would you ever learn to say two words, right? If the waiter brings all your food without a, without a word to you, the, the food you like, why would you ever need to speak? So um, I think what I learned in this, this first job was really how to adjust my variables. So as soon as the child had difficulty, I could move the variables down so the child could succeed. And then, but right, I always had to push myself to right away and move back into greater and greater challenge. And I think this yellow one is where we get, get the most bang for our buck. But as I went on, I realized that um, task challenge is not the only variable to engagement. Uh, tension is also, you know, always on the table. And the child's physical state, whether they're tired, they're sick, uh, they're uncomfortable, they're hungry, you know, it's late in the day. I mean, we, we structure our days to, to put the younger kids earlier, <laughs> right? Because the, the older kids can handle it. Um, we use humor, engagement strategies, enthusiasm. And I think most speech paths are pretty good at this. We're trying to um, empower parents to do the same activities at home. I think sometimes we shine over them. And so we have to empower them with these kind of engagement strategies rather than taking the show ourselves. Um, a lot of times you'll know that you probably pass a task to a parent and they'll look, the child just look back at you because you're the fun one. Well, that's, you're losing a lot of engagement between the sessions that way. Um, the relationship you have with that child, whether they trust you, whether they, uh, they're excited to see you, they have fun with you, they see you as a communicative partner. Um, and of course, age and development, which I'll talk about in a second. Task difficulty, either real or perceived. You know, if you failed an activity, you might just see it as too chaotic. Anything with too many items might be too difficult. And so they'll just latch on to that, that aspect and think this is impossible because there's too many objects out there. Um, but you can take on those areas by putting out a very easy task and starting with a small group and build confidence in that type of task before you start challenging them with content. And of course, we're gonna talk a little bit about following a child's interest, which I, I really like. I mean, I love the fact that, that you guys can have the right game and they can pick they, they can pick the fun game, but you can pick the right target for each of those games. So let's just talk about how attention kind of develops with age. 
Now the, the white line is how long they'll probably attend to an object on their own or a toy on their own. And we, we all know, those of you who work with preschoolers, you know how many activities you have to have, backup and actual ones. Um, but with engagement with another, uh, usually a parent or, or a therapist, we can get that ex extension of that, that engagement, that attention. Um, and you see that even as they get up to two and a half, they start to increase their engagement with an activity, even if in, they're in, in parallel play. So there might be just another child playing beside them or near them, and that might even help them just stay with task a little longer. Um, and as we get older, we get further. And by the time we're five, we can kind of hang in there, especially with some, some help by the, by the adults. So it's good to think of this as a developmental progression and to realize that some kids, you know, this is variable. Some kids have trouble with, with attention and have trouble staying to task. Um, I like to always self-reflect at the end of a session that didn't go well or an activity that didn't go well. Why did I lose them? And each child will have different barriers. So with a flight plan for an activities, usually I think of what activities I have laid out, you know, and for a little guy, yeah, you have more. And for an older guy, you have less. Um, but I try to arrange it so that it's king and then ace. So the ace is a little higher here. It's a little more interesting than our king, but the king's a good activity to start with because that gets your session going, right? And then maybe something that's a little less exciting or a little less interesting, I'll bury in the middle, queen and then Jack and 10. So as a, a, a normal um, session with five activities, this is how we hope it'll go. <laughs> they start to lose their attention with Jack, but you pull it back up with Queen, goes down with a 10 and back up and you finish strong and they wanna come back to your session the next time. Uh, but sometimes it goes like this. And yeah, it might have to do with child variables, right? It might have to do with, yeah, how engaging you are that day. Um, now, what you could do is just bail on the 10 and move to the ace, but you could also have an ace up your sleeve. So you might have just one activity that you could use next time, next session, but you know it's going to be very interesting. And so you might just go to that, you know it's starting to go down, so you might just pull out the ace and then go to another ace at the end and you get through your whole session and the child is reinforced for attention and wants to come back, you know, eager to go. Line of sight sometimes can help too. You know, a child who sits in a, a haircut for a haircut the first day, he doesn't know how long this is going to last, how long you have to sit still and have somebody clicking these scissors around your head. It's great to know what you're in for. And um, sometimes if you just have the activities, I used to have a long table, I used to have the activities kind of laid out in the order that I would pull them in. Um, some kids get very distracted by that, but others like to have that line of sight so they know how long they're they're in for it and what's coming. And some of it works as reinforcer for getting through it because uh, they can see the fun ace at the end. Um, so it's a good strategy, I think, for, for some kids who bail because they just feel like it's going on forever. So when we're talking about interest though, we've got low interest going up to high interest. Let's put another a graph up here that kind of plots things. Less rich language to, to very high rich language. And our best flight is here where it's high rich, meaningful language and high interest for the child. And there's lots of information about how powerful this can be for a child, for how much more they learn, how much more they're engaged, how much more they take what you've taught them and they, they apply it, uh, generalize. Um, and I guess that means we have to stay out of this zone where it's low interest and less rich language. I've had some, some activities like that, but <laughs> they, they were discarded. Um, I think sometimes what we go for is the target. And uh, you know I've seen a lot of comments uh, about how, well, we're not there to entertain the child. We're not there to interest the child. I think that's a losing strategy. I think um, sometimes we just wanna push this content in so desperately that we rob the activity of fun just to get what we think is work. Um, for the, these kids, play is work. So when we do adult controlled, it might be low interest and it might be uh, very 
rich language, many, many more meaningful repetitions, but I think, I think we lose there. So what we could do is to bring it over is to, of course, increase the interest. And we can do that by adding you know, some play, some pretend. Uh, we can link it more to the child's personal interests. Um, we can lead in from a high interest activity. Um, we can even work on themes. And themes, the excitement of the first theme will take them to the less exciting activity on the same theme because they're still in that, that play mode. Sometimes you just follow a child's lead. And I think a lot of times we're guiding parents to do this because of um, their reluctance to leave their own agenda. Uh, but naturally, I think even good, good language facilitators, good parent language facilitators, they will point things out and say, hey, look, you'll be interested in this. And they, then they add information about that and talk about that, in, that information. So I think sometimes what we do is we set the stage and that child is interested in that, but they wouldn't normally just go to it themselves. I think if the child wants to leave, we, we, we examine why and we try to change things. But um, for the most part, if it's child controlled, it may not fit our targets or what we think is the best uh, use of language for that. So what we could do is we could just brainstorm ahead about what language opportunities there might be for this high interest activity the child usually cho chooses. Or we could set the environment to limit those choices to things that we think we can make something of. And we might do strategies to maximize their attention and take more conversational turns. So we'll use more strategies that way just to make the most of of what they've chosen. So when I'm considering making an activity, I always think of two things. I think of how much the child will be engaged and how well does this tool work for a therapist uh, to, to address their, their own goals. And so I think of a tool sometimes because I think, okay, I gotta work on the handle, making sure the handle is exactly what makes it easy to use for the therapist. And I also have to work at the end of the tool, which which is for the child, what will resonate the best for the child. For example, uh, for a lot of my games, I open it up on Facebook and I say, guys, how's this working? I'm worried that this is too slow or do you think this will be fun? Or do you think, and I've gotten a lot of great feedback and I've made changes to my decks and it's hard. It's hard to always go back and redo these. I mean, I realized um, through Facebook that my, my articulation cards didn't show enough diversity. So I went back over a summer and I, I redrew or I recolored a lot of my, uh, my images. And then I had to go through all my decks and change them out. And it was so worth it because now those decks are more usable, are better for the kids and the therapists feel better about using them. Right now I'm trying to launch um, both Spanish and French and I've opened up uh, this, uh, just yesterday I put this up, is a Facebook page where pe French therapists can tell me which of all of the images I have are best for that particular sound. So I put up screenshots and now I'm getting great feedback about what they think are the best sounds. I'm not, I'm not choosing that, they're better at choosing that and this will uh, really help to make a more powerful product that, that will work for them. So what I do is I usually pick a game that works for the child and I think, okay, how can I modify that child, that, that sorry, that game to um, cover articulation or minimal pairs or Spanish or French or whatever a therapist might be able to use that game well for. And so the child can pick the game and the therapist allows them to pick from a choices of games that actually serve their therapeutic purpose. Now I go to meaningful. I just like to show this I got from a, from a study that just compared all the different natural language approaches. And I thought it was kind of interesting how a lot of them just work on situational interests. So they know that kids really like to play house or they play, or the, these are things that they like to do with cooking or whatever, but very few, um, some only half, kind of address finding what the child's personal interests are. Now, does that pay off? I mean, I know that most, most boys like pirate games. So yeah, it's a pretty safe bet to pick a pirate game for a four to six year old. Um, but some kids have very strong personal interests and we can really up engagement if we're having trouble. So these are my twins and they're more different now as they're older. 
They're both 11 now. Um, but I knew they were different right from birth. This one likes princesses, pretend tea party, stuffed animals, movies. And this one loves superheroes and Taekwondo and soccer and cooking and wrestling and crafts. This is one of the few days they wore the same thing on their birthday. Usually uh, the, uh, Nash on the right wears superhero clothes. So anyway, um, you can just see how each kid brings their own interests and it's good to attend to that because we can really increase the engagement. I was just looking at the internet today and I saw M Mrs. Speechy uh, put up this about um, supporting special interests. It improves peer connections. Usually when kids are talking about high interest for them material, they have more complex language and it'll improve their confidence because they're talking about something that they're, they've grown an expertise at, right? This article shows, uh, shows how kids will have different interests and a lot of them will be intense interests, like intense. Um, this was 177 kids who all were, they were, um, they were, the parents were asked about what, what high interest materials they have. And you see idiosyncratic down here. I remember reading this article and one kid uh, liked roadkill. <laughs> so in all the other cases, the parents supported those interests because they knew the kid was so interested. But imagine the language that happened was that as these children were, were following this. And you see that boys, yeah, a good bet is vehicles. But sometimes, yeah, you don't know for that particular child what it'll be. Um, when you look at how often this happens, okay, 61 had no single intense interest, but that's only a third. 65 had a moderate, moderate interest in one thing. And you see that here girls are very likely <laughs> to have a moderate interest versus an intense one. It's almost the same as having no interest, but it's a pretty good bet. And you look how much uh, the boys having no single interest is very rare. It's only 18 boys. And here for an intense image, let's see if I can move my face here so I can see it. Yeah, 38 boys and 13 girls. So we've got some intense interests that we can feed into and get some, some real engagement there if we just ask the parents. So there, there are a lot of online uh, forms we can go through and get, um, get very interesting um, like tallies of what their interests are and, and how, what they do about that in the home. And that really will help us. I know there's not a lot of time sometimes to adapt, but if we're having trouble engaging a child and they have a intense interest that we're missing. I think we're really missing the boat here. Uh, I came across this book that has strategies to use, fascinations, area of expertise, and strengths to support students with autism. Now, I haven't been talking about children with autism. Of course, they have um, intense fascinations as well. Um, but that study from before were kids, typical four to six-year-olds. This is my son and his calendar that I made. And if you notice in the chat, there are some links at the top that I posted. Uh, I've put the Spanish one up and the English one up for you to download and print, because I think this is a great tool. You see in the English one, it says today here, and you move this along with poster putty. So they know this is today. And after one sleep, they're going to go visit grandma. We might have a photo there, or we might have a, one, a drawing that they did themselves. And we can move their um, we can move, sorry, we can move these tokens around each week. And as they have a sleep, we move this around. And then we can talk about what did we do yesterday? Or what are we going to do the day after tomorrow? Or when are we going to see grandma? Oh yeah, not tomorrow, but the next day. And all of a sudden we're talking in future tense, past tense. So we're getting a great, meaningful use of future tense, past tense with things that they're high interest of. And so this is a great thing to put on a bedroom wall because, um, we can get a lot of just conversations about their, their daily life. We used it a lot because they had to go to this, this private school where they had all these different uniforms every day and we couldn't keep them straight. So we took photos of them and we put them up on each day. So someone would run up and look at the calendar and say, oh, we have to wear the whatever that day. Now, selective emphasis, this is very important to me. Um, it's where, the, the task, not the therapist, holds them accountable for saying the target. So this example is from, from you know, initial constant deletion. So I've got a barrier here that I can see over. 
And when it's the child's turn, they can see over. I don't like barrier games where you've got a huge barrier you can't see. And at the end, you move the barrier and say, oh, we did pretty good, we made some wrong, but I'm not sure why, but we did most of them were right. You don't learn from that. But if I tell him, put the, put the orange fruit loop on the P and they put it on the E, I'm going to think, oh, I didn't, I did, I got to, I got to say that again. <laughs> I've got to correct it. And what's the way to correct it? To make sure I put that P on the beginning of the word. And it's the same for them. They have to listen for it when they're a listener and they have to speak it when they're the speaker. Now, this is much different than just saying, we're going to practice our P sound. Do it like this, pa, pa, pa. This is where we show them the power of including it. And this is where we get, get um, generalization. But I think for today's talk, what I'd like to emphasize is that this is the way for them not to feel tested and not to resent you. Because when you do show them how to make that P sound, you're helping them. You're helping them over a communicative uh, breakdown. And they'll be thankful for it instead of thinking, why are you making me say that sound? Well, now the, the task shows you why. <laughs> There are barrier games. I mean, I've seen some boom cards. I don't want to point out anything, but you know, to practice under, they just how do you just drag a million things under? But there's no reason to really pay attention to the word under once you learn the first task. You just know where it goes and you start pulling them all over. Photo barrier. Let's say I have these objects and I put them in a different way and I take a picture of it. And then I put them in a different way and I take a picture of it. Well, I can hold up this picture and I've got to use my language and they have to use their listening to put the objects in the right place. And instead of saying, no, listen again, I told you to put it under, you know, I, I look confused and upset at the picture and they realize we failed together. It's very different than uh, this kind of test and push. Um, here's another example where I have these, these things I print and I put these guys on, on, um, on clothes pins and I just put the clothes pins around. So I might have the boy went to McDonald's and the girl is at the farm. And so they can't see it because I'm holding it up like this, but I'll say, you know, he, he's having a hamburger and she's milking the cow. And so I can see how they place their, their um, clothes pins. And this makes it a joint venture you know they get to listen and they get to speak and there's a reason for including those sounds or listening for those sounds this is a a boom card whoops this is a boom card deck that um i put up and it's still free it's called tall or tall orders and what you can do is you drag these little meals down here to the right person so we've got um uh, that's supposed to be me. <laughs> the, the man in the blue shirt with the glasses wants the fish. And see so how I've put that there. Now we can move this orders and it's all blank. So we can just take turns telling the other person where to put the food. But you see that, um, that actually with this, we're being held accountable to where things go, right? And the task is holding them accountable. Um, this is an activity I'm working on. It's called Granny's uh, Old Camera. And Granny, camera works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't so what you're supposed to do is pose pose the cat maybe I'll, I'll decide or the child decides to put it beside the couch and then we try the camera and oh no the cameras okay this camera's no good the cat's on on the couch and you see how there's a reason to talk about both because one you're directing and the other one you're checking and so this is just an example of how selective emphasis can really help take that that test um, aspect away from your treatment and get more engagement. Because the activity holds the participants responsible, uh, not the therapist, but the therapist can come to the rescue. So uh, this happens a lot with story retell. They're like, why am I telling you a story? You already told it to me and now you know it. But um, in this task, uh, you know, their friend Booker went to get popcorn and he missed the beginning of the movie. So in this deck, you, um, you have to tell Booker what happened and re recast it. But there's a reason, there's a meaningful reason for that. Now, if you look at the, um, the links uh, in the chat, you'll see that this deck I've just put for free tonight, uh, but you can get it anytime tonight. I'll just change it tomorrow.
So I'd like you to try if you haven't already. Let's talk about fun. <laughs> one thing that make it fun is more choice. Now, one problem I have right now, I think I've got too many games. <laughs> so I've got this one boom deck that's a decidinator, I call it. And you can choose cooperative, you can choose competitive, or you can choose all. And you just click and then stop it. And it'll stop on the activity that you should play with. But I think it's much more powerful if you let them choose. And so what I choose to do for my icons is to make them very recognizable for the child because they will recognize the game they like and want to replay it. And so I've got this A here. That means there are articulation decks, uh, but we might just put um, a card of, of, the, of the icons that we want or lead them to different folders where we have the icons on the computer where they can pick. And then the child picks that, but we've, we've set the goal. I add sound effects lately. And I think when I, when I look at this, you know, sometimes you can get a game that's too engaging, you know, like who uses, <coughs> excuse me, who uses PlayStation and therapy? Nobody, because the child is just get lost into the game. And I think this is one thing where boom cards can be fun, but they're not fun without another person to talk over the game and to move the characters around. And I like that it's just kind of drag and drop. But every so often I think, wouldn't this be kind of more fun if you heard a little squawk from the, from the um, flamingo or you hear the cats being you know, scared off the fence or you hear the space alien drinking all the, the fuel for your spaceship. So these kind of, uh, these kind of embellishments I think are great. It took me a while to learn how to do it. What I do is I make it just first as an image. And then I, I write down the size and the position of what that is. And then I put in a sound and you can change the background image of a sound. And so I put the same in, image in there and it looks the same. You can make it draggable. Uh, you can pull it to the same um, drop zones. And, but when they move it, it will make the sound. So I don't want it happening all the way through a therapy session. Uh, but I think sometimes it can kind of increase the story, make them have a little more fun being engaged. So we have to look at competition. And we've talked about how some kids, you know, they don't like competition. Other kids, it's a real, a real aid. So when competition is an aid, I hate to admit this, but I love when I find a kid that's really competitive. And um, I can even make it, a little crazy. I, I remember I used to have uh, a, a crown from Burger King. And if I won, I would find the crown, I put it on my head and I would do the walk of victory around the therapy room. And I could just see the, the child thinking, I'm going to win the next one. And it would drive him to want to work harder for the next game. Um, and then, yeah, even be even worse. Sometimes when the child won, I couldn't find the crown somehow. You know, it wouldn't be where I thought it was. And then I would win again, I'd find it. <laughs> so it would drive some kids crazy though. They would be so upset. And so what I've realized is that um, sometimes when you, uh, when you have one of these competitive games, you can uh, pull in a little character at the end or a trophy at the end, uh, just to celebrate the winner. Now, I think some kids may not want that pulled in if they've lost the game. I think we have to be careful with some kids, but even on the self-play games, we've got these, you know, if you've done this kind of job, you get the trophy, even better, you get this trophy, but a bit of a tease if you didn't do, do so well. Some kids can handle it, some kids can't. Now you notice these ones with the blue dot, that means my game is cooperative. And I've heard from some people on Facebook that they, they say, you, know, you can pick any game as long as it has a blue dot. And it means they are allied games, cooperative games. For example, Halloween meanies, you're trying to find all the treat bags that the Halloween monsters have stolen. And if you get these all back and have one exit, uh, you win the game. So she's got to get out there. But if all the exits are blocked, uh, you don't win the game. So you're kind of helping her to win. And so all the players kind of win together or lose together. And that's the same for this one where the boys have been playing with the pets and they're all missing. So you have to put the pets back in the, in the cages before the, the shop closed. You see two puzzle pieces are already in place and starting to get dark. This is gonna say closed. So um, 
these are all cooperative games that really take the edge off for kids that have trouble with competition. So for some kids, complexity is a barrier and um, some um, kids are the first to recognize that this game is kind of like that one. And this game is kind of like that one. So they can learn their, uh, their game rules and they almost find comfort of just jumping in a new game and understanding and having a deep understanding of how it should work. Um, so I don't like to change the games too much if it follows a, a, uh, sorry, a game instructions. I don't wanna throw something at them because I've, I've had failures like that before. With boom cards, usually the submit button is to check if something's right but I've had some fun making submit buttons that actually check if you've guessed right. And for kids that don't do well with complexity, they don't understand why they didn't get it right. It's not that they got it wrong, it's just that they need to guess again. And so, um, so typically I like to keep the complexity a little lower and a little more consistent. Right. I'm gonna zoom through this one, but just, just everyone, must, I think this is self-explanatory. Story makes kids engage, right? All of a sudden pretend or some sort of story. Here's an experience book that a parent, uh, I saw a, leaf, a tree with leaves. Is that a story? Who wants to talk about that? But I lost my toy in the leaves. All of a sudden it becomes a very exciting story that you want to find out what the answer is and what, what happened and the child gets to express it. And of the nine top fan favorites, eight are story-based. Right? Eight are also cooperative, just to sell those. Now, these kind of ones have less story. You're just trying to put the fish back in the fish bowl. It's not much story there. There is pretend. And you'll see there's a little, uh, little castle for the, for the fish bowl of the winner at the end that you can choose to use. This one has more story because the farmer's worn red pants. And of course, the bull thinks that's pretty interesting. So you have to build a fence to protect the farmer before the, the bull gets down the hill. But I also have some games like this where you have to problem solve to get the, the little character through all the obstacles. So you have to find a, a toboggan to get down the hill, skates to get through the river. Here's, a, here's an umbrella for the cave of falling icicles all the way through to win the game. And so there's lots of talking here, but also lots of story. Um, in the first class boom deck, as I, I mentioned, uh, the free, it's gonna be free till tomorrow. Um, we go through and we watch little movies and we decide what the characters needs and only one of these will work. And this is one where the, yeah, the submit button will help you because if they pick the wrong item to solve Hansel and Gretel's problem, for example, um, they, they won't progress. And here is Booker, the, the friend at the end, and he needs you to tell him the whole story now because he fell asleep. Like he's got a little popcorn in his hair. So you can either, Tell them what happened or you just say you have to go if you don't have time for that. But here we've got a drag and drop uh, scene where you can retell the story. And I think this is a, a great language activity for, for someone who's already worked through all of these. They, they can feel proud about assigning the different objects and talking about why they need them. And for these kind of games, they feel more in the story because they're helping the characters. So I love these games where you try to, you know, you try to help the character along, especially when you're trying to find objects to help them a lot. This is a Red Riding Hood deck. I also put it free until tomorrow. And you try to build them into story. So first you have a game where you can practice, learn the different vocabulary you need. Uh, then you can do this um, sequence card activity. And at the end, I like to hide granny under one of the cards. And, and so you take turns trying to find her. Um, so you'll explain, okay, well, granny's in bed and he, she hears a knock on the door. So all of a sudden you can peek under there and see if granny's there. At the very end, we've got a whole scene here where we can act out the whole story. So you can assign different characters and get lots of language and, and things from that. All right, so that's my talk. I hope I gave you some ideas of what I consider when I'm making boom cards and hopefully it's working out there, but lucky for me, I've got a huge group on Facebook that, that keep me honest and keep me straight and keep it fun. So um, if anyone has any questions, we have to answer. If you want to email me instead, uh, you can email me anytime. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. That was amazing. And I'm just floored by the intricacies of your boom cards. 
Um, we've got so many comments in the chat about how much they love your boom cards. Can I just quickly share some of those comments before we get into the Q and A? Um, sure. Suzanne says, I'm so excited to be here. I love Dave's materials. And Michelle says, thank you so much for all you've done for us school as a SLPs who are working with our students during this pandemic. That's nice. Thank you. Uh, Cassie says, my students, I absolutely love your resources, Dave. Thank you so much for making them accessible for us. It's made a huge difference in my teletherapy practice. And so on and so forth. It's It goes on and on and on. There's a lot of love. <laughs> okay, great. I, I need that. Thank you. And for those who have been asking, um, if you do look in the chat now, there's a lot of comments, but um, Dave and um, some of us reposted the links to his free decks. Um, so we'll email them to you, but that email will get to you maybe tomorrow, about 24 hours after this presentation. So I'm not sure if they'll still be free. At I'll, that I'll, leave, I'll leave it up till, uh, till midnight tomorrow night. And then that way, okay. a chance. So. Cool. So we will email you the links uh, for those boom cards. Um, thank you so much, Dave. Sure. So on to uh, some questions here. Uh, Katie asks, do you have any suggestions for children who have difficulty making choices? I once had a student who enjoyed playing games, but was overwhelmed by making choices of any kind. Do you have any suggestions for encouraging engagement in kids like that? I wonder why they were having trouble with choices. So are they overwhelmed by the responsibility for that? Or um, so I guess my first instinct is to start getting them to make very small choices, like what color do you want to play with? Or what, what uh, do you want to go first or second? Those kind of things. And then, and then work them into it and show them that they can get some sort of control over that. I think most kids are encouraged by that and feel power through that. So, um, so I think for maybe for some kids, that's a little overwhelming to have that kind of responsibility. So I think to keep choices small and keep choices simple and just to work up from there, I guess. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, Lisa asked, I know this webinar is for boom cards. Uh, but I was wondering if you ever will ever be updating the speechtree.com site with some new games. I was there from the Troll in the Bowl CD and weekly games and would love some of the new games on the site. We are back in person in Montreal. Okay. And the kids love the paper versions. Okay. Well, the paper versions, um, I, as, as I'm figuring out the boom one sometimes i do update them and i make uh, new drawings and i add things i think will be a little more fun or i make it more diverse characters and so i've slowly added some games too that are not on the speech tree site but my idea for the speech tree site is that parent accounts can happen and so you can assign a parent account and it's called speechtree.ca and parents will get one principal game every week a different one that uh, that they can work with on the on the speech target that the that the therapist has chosen. So the parent has a mother account, and then so anyway, that's speechtree.ca, and uh, I am planning on updating that site. I'm hoping I can get to it this year, uh, but it's going to have all the new games, uh, all the revised versions of the other games, and um, I'm hoping I can add French and Spanish at that point as well. So I'm kind of hanging on because. I think the first drive is to get all the all the boom card versions done. Um, I do have a printable bundle that's through Teachers Pay Teachers that has, um, I know you don't wanna spend for a speech tree and also spend for that, but the, the bundle on Teachers Pay Teachers has, has all the new ones as well. Um, but uh, yes, speechtree.ca will, will, uh, will get updated probably this year. Great. Um, I did want to mention that, you know, um, 
Lisa, you mentioned you wanted, you're, you're back in person with your students in Montreal, uh, and you wanted to use print materials or paper versions, but we can actually print boom cards. And if you go to the actual boom card, there's a drop down menu um, with an action on on the button. And if you push that drop down menu, you'll, you'll have an option to print the boom cards. But boom cards as a digital tool is great for in person as well. I mean, they can be used on iPads, Chromebooks, they can be used on whiteboards interactive whiteboards and students I think the whiteboards, the whiteboards are the most exciting thing. I think yeah. it would be very exciting to see them on a whiteboard. So. Yeah, so we've got a lot of teachers who use them on whiteboards as well. So it's very versatile. Um, you can use it in person as a digital tool or, or print them out if uh, your students prefer that method of learning better. Yeah, I have a friend who was unwilling when they went back in person to give up the boom the boom card version so she she takes her computer around to all the different places where she has to work she says it's well worth the carrying <laughs> so, so because one, one advantage of boom cards too is that it's all at hand i mean you just you just choose the right one and all the materials come up and there it is you know and so the print materials are a little more work sometimes it's nice to mix them up but uh, i like how easy it is to just to choose a game and get into it um, the videos, uh, I thought, okay, well, some people might need to watch it the first time. I always use videos as instruction. Turns out the kids will watch the video and it'll be a task for them to explain to everybody else how to use the game. So, so there's lots that boom cards have that the printed versions don't, but I know that some kids really like the manipulative. So I think it's a good idea to mix too. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what do you think the benefits are of using boom cards in on the digital platform versus the print versions? Well, um, I, think, I think one advantage of, of the print versions is that you can, you can easily just switch goals and put different cards on top of the little items. But uh, the boom cards, they have these sound effects, they can actually see the, the objects moving. And when you're in telepractice, the great thing is that the child often has to explain what they want to do next or what, they, what choice they need to do. So I feel like sometimes you get more talking uh, over that. Um, and I think the biggest thing is that it's all organized there. So you just click on the right game and it's all set up for you. And then you can move quickly to the next one. So it actually saves you prep time and it saves you uh, therapy time that's better spent, you know, working on your targets. Good point. Uh, Michelle asks, have you thought about making sets for complex S clusters like uh, SPR, SPL, STR, SKR, SKW, do you have printable versions of the minimal pairs pictures? I have not got that done yet. We're talking about teachers pay teachers again, but anyway, I've got, I've got the decks being made for minimal pairs, which I think for the reason of selective emphasis are our main thing to say, okay, if you say it this way, I'm not gonna understand you. So I love minimal pairs and I will have the printable versions up um, and I recognize that with the boom card, sometimes I need, uh, there's going to be, I'll need more, um, more targets to better, to be a better tool. I usually require 16 for the game format that I have. And I, I just kind of thought, okay, if I can't get even near 16, then it's not a target that I, I think needs necessarily to be addressed. But I'm in the same kind of spot where I was talking before is that I'm, Generally, right, I'm at a stage right now where I'm generally trying to give what most people will like. And now um, I'd like to move on to more language activities where some people could really put to use and some people really need those, those triple blends. And so I'm gonna try to, to get to those. But I, I'm writing my thesis, so don't give me more work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I'll get to you're... it, I'll get to it. I, I wanna hear that, I wanna hear all those things. That's my favorite thing to do. So I love to draw, I love to create. And so the best way I think to give me ideas is through the Facebook group that I, I started for Troll in a Bowl, Troll in a Bowl apps. And um, usually, yeah, I think, okay, someone said, oh, I really want the character to be able to move. It was a lot of work, but it was, it made the game much more fun for the child to actually help the character escape once the game was won, you know, so. 
Great. So um, I'm assuming that they can email you at dave at wordplay.ca and probably get a link to join your Facebook group. Definitely. Okay. Uh, Sandra asked, uh, would you kindly show the slide with your nine most popular decks again? Oh yeah, sure. This was um, this was a I, I forget how many people there there were that participated in this, but um, what what amazed me were how many how many how close it was. There was lots of lots of tenth uh, to fortieth place, um, but these ones got clearly more votes. And so um, this is RSP wrestling, and this is actually the only competitive one. It managed to get a gold, uh, but the others are all story based. Um, trying to get the, yep, trying to get them through their obstacles and help them out, so. Um, Jennifer asks, do you think you will ever link your minimal pairs with the auditory compass with the levels? Yes, um, so some of you know me from, I, I created um, an online resource through Advanced Bionics, it's called The Listening Room. And it's a free resource where you can go in and get a lot of printables there. You just have to join. I, there's no cost. And that's uh, through Advanced Bionics called The Listening Room. It's also through Phonak Hearing Aids. And there's hundreds and hundreds of activities that I've created for them. Um, and so what I was going to say is that, yes, yeah, so most people, most of it is for language for children with hearing, permanent hearing loss, especially children with cochlear implants, I guess. But it ends up being useful for for children who have language delay or pretty well anything. But I also have developed a hierarchy of listening skills and I have cards for all of that. So that's also a next step. It's not as big a, um, a group to serve to get that done, but that, of course that's a, that's a favorite of mine. So I want to both put up the, um, the placement test for the hierarchy and also activities for, for listening. And so that they can work on uh, this audit auditory discrimination in a step-by-step -step way. Wow, you have a lot of resources that you provide out there, and and it sounds like this one's free, so that's fantastic. Yep, yeah, it's a uh, actually it's a great resource. They changed it a bit, so now it's I find it a little harder to find things because it's just it's just too many stuff, it's too much stuff on there. So that's that's not a bad thing, but no, you got to really dig all. in. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Um, Shelly asked, would you consider reorganizing your decks into three syllable word targets? Yes, I would consider that. And I, I um, have thought about it. One, one thing I might have to do, though, is to provide different games for that, because at this point, each bundle for each game has about 22 decks. And each deck has several, sometimes up to 10 different uh, versions just because of the different targets. So to reorganize something like that um, is just too big a task. It would slow me down from, from new products, but um, I would consider releasing a series uh, that, that follows that because I know um, that's important uh, for helping kids to kind of take on more when they're having trouble with the, the different syllables. So yes, I will consider that. <laughs> Not would I, I will. Uh, Lauren has another ask. Uh, have you considered separating the minimal pairs into separate cards in your minimal pair games so we can use that selective emphasis? Okay, I, um, I tried to do selective em emphasis with those minimal pairs because you'll notice there's a red dot under one of the items. So there's always two cards. So there might be P and E, for example. On one card, there's a, a red dot under the P and the other one's the E. So if the child says E, I will go right to the E card, the one with the red dot under the E. But if the child, if the child says P, like he wanted to, <laughs> he can see me go right to the P card. So, so I've tried that with with that. But I would like to try some other minimal minimal care, pair tasks other than just the the troll and the bull games. But my first step is just to get this um, series. I've got eighty five games now, and I think I might stop at a hundred. But um, but when I get up to a hundred, I'm going to start moving on to a lot a lot more language tasks and a lot different, maybe some more uh, minimal pair tasks. Wow, 85 games, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Julie asks, I wonder if your vocabulary decks are available on Boom. I printed many early in my career and as a teacher for the deaf and hard of hearing, and I love them. They, they're sitting here just waiting to be made decks up too. So I've got, you remember I showed the one game with all the different cards. I almost put up the, the vocabulary one, but I don't want to promise it early. But I have all these, you know, I, uh, early in my career, I started drawing material because for four-year-olds who were just starting from scratch, there were no activities to engage them that had such a low listening task. And so I, uh, my first, my first projects were to develop these workbooks that are sold through Alexander Graham Bell. And then I moved on to work with advanced bionics on the listening room. Um, but there is a lot of material that I have that I still have to adapt for boom that I think could work really well with it. So, so it's all just sitting there in the vault waiting for me to, <laughs> sometimes I look at them though. I think, Oh, I hate this drawing. Oh, and I've only improved a little bit, but I can't, I have to redraw it. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Uh, Lisa wants to know, could you share your thesis topic? Curious minds want to know. Okay, sure. I, um, okay, I'm, I was auditory verbal therapist and speech language pathologist. And I worked with my wife in Mexico. Uh, we had a clinic there and I came back to school to, to really try to help with parent education. And so when I first started, I wanted to create a program that helped them to improve the quality and quantity of language in the home. But since I'm working with kids with hearing loss, it turns out the first step is to have parents keep the hearing aids on the child all day, every day. So this is a real problem. They've shown that if you have hearing aids on 10 hours a day, regardless of the degree of hearing loss, you can have age appropriate language by the time you hit kindergarten. So that's, that's with infant hearing program, early fit aids, all the one, three, six. If you get everything in place and the hearing aids are on 10 hours or more, turns out that parents are keeping them on five hours or less a day. And so uh, I had to look at barriers. I, I did a behavior change uh, intervention and I have 13 videos that are available. It's called Here On Videos. So H-E-A-R-O-N videos on YouTube and anybody can use them. I'm, I'm getting French. Uh, they're putting up French versions now. We have some Dutch versions and the next step is Spanish versions but they use behavior change techniques <laughs> to influence or to train or to persuade parents uh, to keep those hearing aids on those little ears. So, so um, right now I just have to write it up and it's all done, but I've got 13 videos up there. Wow, that's fantastic. Again, so many resources that you're providing um, largely free of charge. So thank yep. you so much. And we really My appreciate pleasure. you um, spending your, your evening with us. And um, I can see from the comments, our viewers really, really enjoyed and appreciate uh, your sharing your knowledge with us as well. So I just wanted to um, kind of uh, show you all, uh, if you have more questions about your Boom Learning account and how do you get help with that. Um, let me show you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I'm in my Boom Learning account. And if you need help um, for pretty much anything, you can go to your settings button. And right down here, we've got a help center. If you click on that, there's FAQs that you can go to really easily. So we've got, for those who are new, which a lot of you sound like you're pretty experienced users, but for those who are new, we've got quick start guides right here at your fingertips. And um, you can also search for uh, different topics that you might need help with, such as um, adding student to a classroom. We can get help there. If you want to talk to us, you can give us a call right here. You can also schedule a call. If you click on that link, it'll, 
you can easily um, enter your information and a convenient time for us to call you back. So that's a really great way to talk to someone for a more specific one-on-one -on -one help. So that's what I wanted to show you all. And also, I'm sorry, I wanted to go back here to the Help Center. If you have any questions, you can also email it to us right down here um, under the Contact Us. You, it will automatically have your user account here, your user ID, so we can go in and troubleshoot your account for you. We can also look at the decks that you might have trouble making if you're, uh, you've are you got an issue creating decks. You can ask your, your questions here and submit it to support. So we'll be happy to help you there. Um, if you've got uh, some time i we would really appreciate if you would uh answer our fill out our feedback survey we are always constantly um wanting to improve our platform and how we serve our customers so you're going to see a link to that feedback form in the chat and if you could fill that out we'd greatly appreciate it um so We've got a whole nother series planned for February. It's going to be all about selling boom cards and how to start selling boom cards. Uh, actually, before I go into that, I would love to ask Dave, do you have any tips or tricks you want to share uh, for those who are thinking about selling their creations? Um, I think the best thing to do is to create something you think works well <laughs> and and really work through it before you release it so i think the best thing to do is to try it yourself and um, then ask a, a colleague to to share it so there are ways to share a deck through boom cards without releasing it and so i think this is a great way to get some feedback before you launch into your store um, uh, i think everyone has great ideas and I, honestly once you start playing with the boom cards it's no more complex than powerpoint so if you figured out powerpoint you can figure out this but it can do actually a lot more than powerpoint so so it's exciting to share what you know works so i i would just suggest yeah trying it yourself and revising it and getting some feedback from others about whether you think it's it's you're on track or not so i've made a lot of mistakes by releasing too too soon but i've had to <laughs> redo the whole thing so <laughs> That's my advice. Well, proof is in the pudding. Your boom cards are amazing. Um, Thank you. you know, in order to share your boom cards, your creations, there is a share button in the in when you're actually in the studio uh, creating your boom cards. There's a share button. Uh, you can just um, share it to whoever you'd like, and they can collaborate on that and help you improve your boom cards as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so our next webinar is next Wednesday, and uh, it's going to be about in, is on intro to selling boom cards with Daniela Sirota. Uh, her store is Speech RS, so we hope you join us there. And in the meantime, happy booming! Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks again, Dave. Thank you. <laughs>